guitar competition and semifinalist in the Tokyo International Guitar Competition. Nicholas Dusson is enjoying a concert career both as a solo performer and chamber musician. And aside from his duties as a performer, Nick is dedicated to the art of teaching and serves on the faculty at Reinhardt University. And today, Nick is going to lay out the history of the guitar and its prevalent use in the American West. And ladies and gentlemen, put your hands together. Let's welcome Nicholas Desson. First, Dr. Jonathan Pilkington is joining me today. He's the voice behind this whole operation. I'm really the pluckiest of people. Well, I'm going I play that guitar for the same reason I love modernist architecture. Whether you like the aesthetic or not, there's a certain optimism to it. And the reason I play that guitar, and the reason I feel it's optimistic, is that was the instrument the instrument you see up there, a much more elaborate, Baroque version of the one I own. That was the instrument of the New World. That, along with the hopes and dreams, was carried in the belly of ships. And that helped form what we understand as the guitar today. So this small, ukulele-looking, mandolin-looking, double-strung, hard-to-tune, very, very light instrument is what led us to what we have today. So, everything I say is going to be very brief. This is the brief history of the guitar. This is a lunch and learn. You have things to do beyond today. This is 500 years of history. <laughs> and we're going to condense. It's a little bit like when I teach uh, world music. Well, here is all of humanity's music in 16 weeks. So, forgive me, but I'm going to leave some out. All right, I played the Courant in double. The reason I play that is because it introduces the guitar as it was when it came to this world, this new world. 
This presentation will be in three parts. The first is to briefly explain the origins of the guitar, which I've already started. The second is to br briefly explain the origins of ballad and its transformation from the old world to the new world, how it changed. And the third is to give an introduction and an explanation of one of the most popular cowboy songs, The Streets of Laredo. So these derogatypes behind me represent the guitar as it was in the early part of the 19th century. This is really where the Western guitar, the, the metal string guitar, right, the steel string guitar you see, picks up. And I'll get into why it becomes a steel string guitar and how it changes then. But this is what you see the guitar right as cities are starting to form. This is a big change from what it came from. This instrument that you saw here, a couple years ago I went to Versailles, and the reason I'm bringing up Versailles is because Louis XIV was the greatest patron of the arts in Europe. He was the richest man and the most powerful man all in one. He also, much to my benefit, decided he wanted to play guitar. Now, to contextualize it, the guitar was the lowest status instrument. The guitar was effectively an instrument of rebellion in more Moorish occupied Spain. It was not an important instrument. And for the most powerful man, and the most rich man, to decide not only does he want to have it at his court, which would have been enough of a favor, he wants to learn it. There were two guitarists at the time who, who played for him. He lived a long time. There was Francesco Corbetta and Robert de Vizet. Corbetta hands it off to de Vizet somewhere you know, in the early part of Louis' life. Of, uh, Louis life. And their two primary jobs were, one, to instruct the king on how to play. The king was a decent student, but he was primarily a dancer. That was his main passion. And the second, which I found to be even more important as I mounted those stairs in Versailles up to the king's bedroom, if you've ever been to the, the Hall of Mirrors, it was to play while the king fell asleep. So the guitar was effectively a night-night time story. For a little bit. So we go from that to come to the new world and those derogatives. So, what you see here are, is exactly what I've already said, but I want to give you this, this idea of Melville and this, this reading I have from Melville. And you know Melville from Moby Dick. Melville was writing at the time just as the guitar was changing from this early instrument into an instrument that was a uniquely American. And this is from an excellent book by Philip Gora about the, um, the history of Martin guitar set, which is what that steel string instrument is. And he opens the book beautifully. He says, bring me the guitar, cries Isabel, the heroine of Herman Melville's novel, Pierre or the Ambiguity, Ambiguities, published in 1852. Now listen to the guitar, and the guitar shall sing to thee the sequel of my story, for not in words can it be spoken. Thus begins one of the most memorable passages in the novel, through which Melville tries to win back a readership that a year earlier had been puzzled and disappointed by his Moby Dick. Unlike his five previous novels, Pierre was set on land, rather than the salt water of the previous tales, and his story would be promised a rule bowl of milk. Like other works in the literary historians identify as sentimental tradition, Pierre centers on a romantic plot. The important part being that Isabel is a guitarist, and is sort of engendering and taking up something that was de jour, that was popular anyway, and making it even more popular through the publication in um, serialization of the novel. Okay, so what is this guitar? As I said, this is a five-stringed, uh, five-course instrument. I'm not clicking there. There we go. There's Melville, and there we have it. I'm up to date. Um, a five-course, meaning they're double-strung. So if those of you are familiar with 12-string, those are octaves, just like a 12-string. So 12-string was a new idea. In fact, it happened 500 years previously in the lute as well. Uh, it uses a re-entrant tuning scheme, which the, those of you who play guitar, that means the highest note is actually nearest to you, not farthest from you. So it's closer to a banjo. So there's a difference there. A banjo comes from a different, comes from an Angoni instrument, comes from West Africa, which also uses a re-entrant tuning. So there's no relation there, but they do have that correlation. And it has this history, as I said, of being folk music, and I have this alphabeto style up behind me, and this was essentially chord charts in medieval and Baroque Italy. And these would be songs that would be sung, and the guitarist would know. And let me tell you, it's not as you have learned it as a guitarist, if you are a guitarist, or as I learned it, it's completely different. There's a chord H, there's a chord J, there's a chord D. They're all different, so you have to kind of reorganize your brain and recompartmentalize 
and your instinct to play a D chord is actually the wrong chord. So it's a different. I won't be playing off of today, but you get the sense. To sort of back up a little bit, we get to the next instrument. So we did the Baroque, and we have this classical 12 string, uh, 6 string here. You notice the waist of the guitar, and that, if you can see, it's much more narrow waisted here in profile. The patina, or the shape of the instrument, changes quite drastically into this figure eight shape that you see that's much more reminiscent of the steel string you see that we're getting to. It had five strings, which will help you understand Lorca's The Five Arrows Wounded, that poem, because there were five strings at the time of his writing of the guitar. And a six was added in the 1750s, the beginning of the classical era. People who talk about classical music are right, but that's just eight years in the whole span of music. So when we talk about art music, classical music. This so-called early romantic guitar starts with a six-string instrument that becomes popular. It covers a repertoire written specifically for the six-string guitar from around 1785 to 1790. For reference, the 13th colony of jo was Georgia, where we are now, was founded in 1732. So it wasn't for another 50 years or so, or 40 years or so, before this instrument comes into being. The five-string guitar, the reason I play that guitar in the cold open, the Baroque guitar was already on the West Coast in California to Spanish missions. There's a beautiful book called Sancho and Sana by uh, Craig Russell that discusses the music of, of the priests and what they brought there and the mixing of the indigenous people and that music. So you had essentially Catholic music masses mixing with Chumash music. It's just fascinating. It's the most interesting book I, I own. One of the most interesting books I own in my library. It's beyond the scope of, of this talk, but it's really, really interesting. Again, that's the instrument that became the belly of ships. All right. So how do we get to an actual steel string? And why do we actually get to a steel string? Why change it from what were gut strings? These are plastic, by the way. No animals injured in the stringing of my guitars. So this, this guitar has plastic strings, and if it looks like they're uh, metal, it's because they have a a, wound, a wind around the, the plastic. On the, I'm talking about the one closest to me here. How did we get from gut strings to steel strings to the music of the West? That's really the question I asked myself when I had this very nice invitation to come here. The way we did it was really interesting. So if you've ever played a gut string instrument, it's very frustrating. The strings break, they get out of tune, and they're expensive, so you spent all this money on a string and then it breaks on you just because you move from literally the, the temperature difference from maybe this room to the next. Almost nothing or negligible. You might put a string out of tune or break it. It's impractical, particularly when you're in a new world, cities are being established, it's difficult to find strings to begin with, and then it breaks on you. You have a problem. What coincided was also the need for bailing wire, this fence I have behind me. Large tracts of land in the west need to hold cattle in fence it in. So you had developments in technology that would allow for better metal strings. Originally used for fencing, but also developed and adapted for the guitar. Okay, so now you have a cheaper technology that's already being used for other things beyond entertainment, <coughs> and is stronger and will last longer. This becomes the obvious choice, and Martin is one of the first to see that coming. This changes the guitar as well. You notice how much smaller that one to the left is or to my left, to your right is, versus the, the steel string. They have to brace it more because the steel strings pull the neck more. That is to say, each one of these instruments is under 100 pounds of pressure or so. That's a lot of pressure, but they're built to do that. So as long as you don't drop them, they're fine. But they have to rebuild the guitar as well. Why do they go to all this trouble over a guitar? Well, I just read Melville's quote to sort of explain that it was a cultural thing. It was of interest. It was something that people could do. But also, if you have to consider that if you're moving west, if you're moving into a new world, what are you going to bring with you? You're going to bring light things with you, things that are portable. A piano is not portable. A piano is not something you drag across in a wagon easily. But a guitar is amazingly portable. And you can have that in the back. You can have it in a gig bag or a case or whatever they had at the time. And it would be with you. And you could have songs. And you could accompany voice. That's where we come in with this other idea of the ballad. So when I thought about this and I thought about what could I do to, ex what could I explain and what could I talk about that might be of interest to such a neat museum as this? And I thought, well, the West is obviously one of them. And also the tradition of ballad singing, of 
of self-accompanying and ballad singing. So you have to consider that there is no Netflix. There are no CDs. There's, no, there's not even a vinyl. There's nothing. If you don't play the music, you don't hear the music. If you don't know someone that plays the music, you don't hear the music. And what I tell all my students who have phones, and everybody has a smartphone, but everybody listens to music on the smartphone, I'd say, you likely could hear more music walking from one of my classes if I was teaching a class with your earbuds in, back to your car, and someone might hear their whole life in the medieval era or the Baroque era or the classical era because it just wasn't available. Your, ch your choices were play the music yourself or know someone that would play it for you. There was really, or have, be rich enough to have someone play it for you. There was really no alternative. So when I talk about the ballad, I'm gonna be talking about really where we are to start with, Appalachia and this history coming down from the north almost immediately. We're gonna talk about the deep south Many of these ballad traditions come in from, on ships, they come south, and they find their place in Appalachia. <coughs> Specifically, they come across the ocean from Great Britain. Today, we're going to play two songs arranged from uh, the tradition of Great Britain ballads. Excuse me. <coughs> so as I said, they were in, initially in New England and immediately came down to Appalachia, where they changed through isolation, forgetting words, through people finding better words, better songs, better chords, development. The person who first started to categorize them was Francis James Child, the, first, the most famous American scholar associated with collecting British ballads, many of his most famous being refer, uh, referenced by the last name and number, for example, Child 13, Edward. Ironically, it was the British folklorist Cecil J. Sharp who discovered that the same British ballads could be found in the United States. So actually, these two scholarly developments happen separately. And they realize, oh, these are the same tunes. They have different names. They might have different endings and different stories. But they're actually the same thing. But they change. They permutate. While child ballads are not generally popular today, the ballad tradition has influenced many popular genres. For example, country music, in particular, draws from the realism of these ballad lyrics, which we're going to get to in a second, often dealing with sorrowful subjects. Even a song such as You Are My Sunshine reveals a ballad influence. It seems surprisingly upbeat and happy, but it's actually about a man worried about his lover that will leave him. So it's a children's song that actually has a sad story to it. Many of these ballads use code words, in, aren't, it, telling you exactly they, what they mean in their words. You have to reference an inference from them. We'll see if this plays. Not. We have plenty of ballads. It was sort of a nice to have if it worked. So, but what I what I have here is basically a French port, front porch ballad, an unaccompanied woman singing by herself, singing about the sorrow, and, and basically the refrain is around how did that blood come to be upon your shirt, and he in the refrain is well basically a lie. I was I was hunting and this happened, but of course it had nothing to do with the hunt. So it's a larger story. Basically, a ballad is a song story for a company for entertainment at a time before we could watch TV, before we could do any of these things. I'm do one out of order here. <coughs> I'm going to turn it over to Jonathan. You're going to talk a little bit about the ballad tradition. He can speak much more accurately to vocal technique and what I have to maybe on the guitar, don't I? All right, so I wanted to, I thought it would be interesting to talk about what a singer like me has to do to sing a folk song. Um, so I'm a classical singer, a classically trained singer, and classical music is what I sing. Um, I don't necessarily perform opera, but I could. It's, it's my training. Um, so my training is not in singing folk songs, which seems like a simple thing, but when you're trained to sing classical music, a lot of times people will approach folk songs in a classical music sort of way, which doesn't really work. It's very, it's just not right. The style is not right. <laughs> um, so actually for my doctoral dissertation, I did my paper on how classical singers, what things classical singers can do to 
sing non-classical songs. Um, so that works really well for today. <clears throat> but first, just some things you probably already know, but typical characteristics of a folk song. They are simple. Um, Robert Walls is a man who wrote an article for the 1950 Journal of Singing, which is a, um, a magazine for voice teachers. And sadly, that was the most recent article I could find when I was doing my research um, on what classical singers need to consider for singing folk songs. So my research was necessary. So what he said was first and chiefly, the folk song is simple, it is direct and honest, and straightforward in its approach, going directly to the heart of its message and stating it without apology or great elaboration. Um, folk songs generally have a narrow range of about you know, five notes to an octave. Um, they have a stepwise melody, so stepwise as opposed to one that jumps around a lot. Um, like, ah, 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 that's a stepwise, very simple melody, as opposed to bum, 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 bum. It doesn't go all over the place. Um, they are syllabic, meaning that uh, there's generally one note per syllable, as opposed to several notes per syllable. And strophic, if you don't know what that means, so considering poetry is written in strophes, <coughs> there is a the same music is used for each strophe of text. Um, so like any Christmas carol, you know, is a strophic song. <clears throat> but this is where the real part of my research is, is what does the classical singer consider to make, try to make it more authentic in performance? So first of all, we have to tell the story. I think that's true for any singer of any song. Um, the story is most important. Impressing the audience with your vocal power is not important. That's something a classical singer really has to consider. I, I need to sing with my real voice, my true authentic voice, but do it in a simple and direct way. And I'm going to demonstrate how I might do this wrong and how I might do it the best I can. Um, I don't think there's any need for me to try to imitate necessarily the twang or the vocal quality of a, of a country singer or a folk song singer, but I need to, it's helpful to listen to them for the style, to figure out, do they do a scoop here, or how do they treat the rhythm of a song? Um, there's a, another quote from the same man. He said, the best folk, I think it's kind of funny, the best folk singing demands a purity of vocal line and form. An even scale enhances the effect. So meaning that your voice sounds the same from bottom to top. Every technical flaw or fault in a voice is mercilessly revealed. And there is little opportunity to cover up with the operatic yell or some other histrionic subterfuge. <laughs> So just sing it simply and let your voice shine. Um, okay, it, it should have a conversational quality. So with, that kind of refers to that quote. Um, but that conversational quality sort of guides the other ideas here. Um, generally, folk songs would be in a lower register of the voice because that's more similar to the speaking voice. So when choosing a key, you, you know, don't put it too high so that you go into sort of the operatic part of your voice. Um, so if you don't know, so there's chest voice and head voice. Chest voice is what you speak in mostly. Head voice is up here. Um, <laughs> so I don't want to approach that much in a folk song unless it's for a special effect. <clears throat> um, Anne Whitley, which could possibly be a name some of y'all know, she's from Dahlonega, I think, and she runs the, it's, I think it's called the Dahlonega Pick and Bow School. I talked to her and she said, if you have to go into your head voice, it's too high. So that's a really simple guideline. Um, I, sh 
should use minimal vibrato in singing folk songs. So the, t the no. standard for singing classical music is you have used vibrato throughout on generally every note you sing. Um, so when we demonstrate, I'm going to do the difference in that. <clears throat> a little vibrato is okay in a folk song. This is according to Ann Whitley and from my own listening, um, if any at all. Diction. So this is slightly tricky. The words have to be understood because you have to tell the story, but they can't be overdone and sound overly formal. Um, if I, um, the first line of Streets of Laredo is, is, as I walked down the streets of Laredo. If I sang, as I walked down the streets of Laredo, that's just too picky and formal. So I have to just, you know, do it more like I'm speaking. And another, I guess the final consideration is uh, considering who arranged the song, if it's an arrangement. So that when we do Streets of Laredo, that is not an arrangement. That's just simple, trying to make it as authentic as possible. But we're doing some arrangements of folk songs um, from England, arranged by Benjamin Britten, a 20th century classical composer. And I think that's sung differently because his were intended for classical singers. Um, so anyway, I guess now we can do the streets of Laredo. Is that correct? Yep. <clears throat> Maybe just for a laugh. I'll, <laughs> I'll sing it wrong.
briefly, I want to, we're going to play just one, one verse of The Unfortunate Ring. So as I talked about, these ballads changed. You all know the streets of Florida. You may not know The Unfortunate Ring, and that's where it came from. And I say it like, I say it like it just came directly. There were dozens of versions. Here's one version. And you can hear some of the similarities between them. The story is different. Um, and you'll, that'll be pretty clear when we do this short bit. After that, I think what we'll do is probably uh, a set of two songs by Benjamin Britten. And those are the folk songs. And those are attributed to Cecil Sharp as well. These are what were collected went back to England and were set as concert music. So the first, so you're going to hear the unfortunate rake briefly. And then you're going to hear, I'll give my love, I will give my love an apple, which is a traditional English song, and the shooting of his deer. And maybe we might take a break in between the apple, talk about the shooting of his deer, which, which has a lot of varied and interesting things. <coughs> explanation of Benjamin Britten, if you don't know much about him. He's from England. Um, he had a very close friend, Peter Pierce, who was a tenor, and they did a lot of collaborations together. He wrote a lot of normal classical music for him, but he also did a, pretty, a book about this size of folk song arrangements. And one set of those folk songs is for voice and guitar, um, specifically. He spent a decent amount of time in the United States. He came over during World War II and uh, was told to stay a bit longer because conditions were just not good in England. So they, he wrote several of his arrangements while he was here. He did some things like I Wonder as I Wonder, the Christmas song that you probably know. Um, and they did a lot of recitals in the country at that time. It's small, but it's a long story, so. Um, 
this tells the story of the mistaken identity, and so this is not really discussing what happened. So the hunter goes out, basically, thinks he's shooting a deer, and ends up being his beloved. And it's tragic and beautiful, and set beautifully. And I should explain this, because a lot of the time I live in my own head, and I kind of think, well, the guitar is doing this, and I don't realize that no one else understands this. But I explained this to a friend recently when we played for them. They said, no, this that's my part. That's the gunshot. As a guitarist, this, this isn't really a chord. This doesn't make a whole lot of sense, but it works beautifully in this. And you have that report coming back and forth. And then later on, when we slow down considerably, you have sort of the beloved coming back as an apparition and discussing, and you have another take. <laughs> Otherworldly kind of sound. So these are some of the songs we will be doing on the 19th. We really appreciate you listening. This is our last number for right now, but we'll be back to play more on the 19th. Thank you so much for your attention. This is the shooting of his deer. Thank you so very much. By the way, I know why King Louis XIV wanted to play the guitar. He wanted to meet girls. <laughs> <laughs> Makes sense, doesn't it? Let's see, if anybody has a question to do before we turn you loose, I know you're coming back. Did anybody have a question? Yes, over there. Were there more guitars or more auto parts in 1900? Let me, let me repeat it because we're recording it. 
Were, were there more uh, guitars or more auto harps in 1900? It's a really good uh, question. Um, they're both mentioned in the literature. I'm not sure. I don't know which one was before. I do. Auto harp. <laughs> <laughs> no, I'm serious. Yeah. I'm yeah. serious. If you look it up, there were more, there were more auto harps in 1900. Sure. Makes sense, yeah. Portable? Yeah. 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 Yes. Since the maker of the Barrett card, more about that. Where did you pick it up? Uh, this is a Barrett guitar builder. He builds all sorts of historical instruments. And should I get on the mic? So. Yeah, get on the mic. Yeah, you don't want a broke guitar because you want one that works. Yeah, I don't want one that works. He builds all sorts of instruments. He's in uh, the Bay Area. His name's Mel Wong. And he built this one inexpensively for me because most classical guitars don't play Baroque guitar, but I felt like I should. I studied in school and I should do something with it. And it's, it opens up like a whole different type of music because whereas the guitar that we know is more of like a tenor romantic sound, this is a very light kind of alto sound, almost a percussive sound. And it's easier than having a harpsichord around your neck. Much easier than having a harpsichord, yes. <laughs> is it tuned in fourths? It is. It's tuned in fourths, yeah. Same tuning. That's in the French tuning. There are three primary types of tuning, and uh, that's that's almost exactly like a guitar, which is why I have a tune that way. Have you guys ever built guitars? Do you ever make any guitars? I have, no. I changed the strings. That's all. I, mean. <laughs> I have some. I have, I'm very fortunate to have people in my life that can repair things if things go badly. If you get a wooden cigar box, you uh, can kind of you know. All right, well, this was a lot of fun. Thank you much. We'll see you again on the 19th. We'll give one more round of applause.